that notion of, of purgatory has always given me hope because it means that God never gives up on me as long as I don't give up on God. Welcome back to the Joyful Catholic Leaders Show, where you'll hear stories and insights from those who lead with faith, from the seminary, to the parish, to the classroom, to the office, to the sports field, and everywhere in between. As we approach the end of Lent and the Sacred Triduum, we wanted to share a reflection on purgatory from one of the St. Paul Seminary's oldest and wisest priests. Why are we here? Where are we going? How do we get there? According to Monsignor Stephen Rolfs, the answers lie in another question. God asks, do you love me more than anyone or anything else? Before we get started, just a reminder to subscribe wherever you find your podcasts and follow both the St. Paul Seminary and St. John Vianney College Seminary on social media and at semsp.org. New episodes of the show drop every month on the first Friday of the month in honor of Our Lady of Fatima and the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus. And now please enjoy this Lenten meditation on heaven, purgatory, sin, and salvation from Monsignor Rolfs, who serves as a spiritual director for seminarians at the St. Paul Seminary and is the former rector at Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Maryland. Lent is a time each year when we sort of take stock of our relationship with the Lord and ask ourselves, well, how are we doing? And each year we try to be better at the end of Lent than we are at the beginning of Lent. And as when I was young and, you know, when in, in, in seminary, I always thought, well, there always, if I don't get it done this year, I can get it done next year. And then the next year after that, there's plenty of time. Uh, but now, after 70 some years of Lent, uh, I say, I need a triage here. <laughs> I may not get it all done. Uh, and so it, uh, uh, I, I begin to ask some really ultimate questions about my life and where I am in the midst of my life. And there's three basic questions that everybody has to ask themselves repeatedly, I think. Um, first, why am I here? Second, where am I going? And third, how do I get there? Okay. Why am I here? Where am I going? And how do I get there? Those are the three essential questions that we have to ask ourselves and ponder throughout our lives. They're not the only three, but they're the basic three. And also, we need to remind ourselves that there's three basic stages in our life. Uh, the first stage we have little memory of, it's the stage in utero when for nine months we exist in our mother's womb. And the purpose of that nine months is to uh, grow arms and legs and nose and eyes and ears and a brain uh, to develop physically so that we can exist in the real world. Uh, And if we come out too early, we have problems. And so we have to develop sufficiently to be able to exist in the real world. And eventually, um, we are, much to the relief of our mothers, we are pushed out, literally, into the real world. And to us, it's like a death. If you ask your mother uh, what your first few moments outside the womb were like, she would say, well, you were scared to death. Okay, Uh, you were screaming and yelling and you didn't know what was, none of us knew what was going on. Uh, We were taken from the only world we ever knew and all of a sudden put into this world in which there was bright lights and there was uh, smacking and washing and sporting of water and coochie-cooing and rapping and we didn't know what was going on. But eventually we sort of settled down. And we said, well, this isn't so bad, okay, in an unreflected sort of way. And uh, we began to relate to people and relate to the outside world, the real world. Um, And then we began to reflect at, you know, seven or eight years old, you know, well, what's this world all about? 
okay, when we reach the age of reason. So we distinguish for, between the world of our mother's womb and the real world. And why am I here? Where am I going? How do I get there? Uh, and by that time, at least I was in Catholic schools and we were taught the catechism, you know, who made you? God made you. Why did he make you? To know him, to love him, to serve him in this world so that we can be happy with him in the next in heaven. Okay? So I knew that. I didn't know what it all meant, but I knew it. And I began to unpack it as I began to develop. And the Christian message is basically that this world isn't it. Uh, this is the real world, but as C.S. Lewis calls, we're meant for more. We are meant for the really real world of heaven. And that's something that when I first heard about it in second grade, I was somewhat confused. Sister also told us, I remember in those days, Sister Florinda told us about uh, limbo. And limbo was where the babies who were, did not get baptized go. And there, we had questions like, well, what's it like in limbo? Well, it's like being on the playground forever. <laughs> hmm, this sounds good. Uh, and I, you know, it, you're perfectly happy, uh, but you don't get to see God. There's no beatific vision. I said, well, I kind of like to see God, but I'd like to be on the playground too. And so I remember going home to my mother and I said, mom, I said, was I baptized? She said, well, of course you were baptized. She said, you're not a pagan baby, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I said, well, why did you do that? I, she said, what do you mean? Why did I do it? I said, well, sister told us I don't get to go to limbo now. I said, this is terrible. I want to go to limbo. She said, well, don't you want to see God? I said, yeah, but I probably get bored after a while. And so, you know, she sat me down and tried to explain things to me that heaven was better than I thought. But I remember saying, well, if, if heaven is where I'm meant to be in the really real world, if that's the really real world, what am I supposed to do down here? And the basic message of Jesus is uh, the prime directive is you have to learn how to love on earth, how they love in heaven. That's the prime directive to learn how to love on earth the way they love in heaven. Everything we do somehow is reduced to that. It's like uh, a compound fraction, 16 30 second, eight sixteenths, four eighths, two fourths, one half. Okay? It keeps being reduced, but it all gets down to that one nugget. Uh, I have to learn how to love on earth the way they love in heaven. Um, Every, about every decade, I think I learned something new, some new facet of that prime directive. It's all connected. Uh, I remember my, I'll, I'll tell you the first, I don't have time to do all of them, but uh, besides you have to learn it on your own. Uh, but uh, the very first one was that I used to hit a kid by the name of Ted Heil. God rest his soul. Uh, and I didn't hurt him or anything, but it, the boys used to play a, 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 a game on the playground of basically achieving dominance and marking who was head of who. And so we would go out and hit each other on the arm. And depending, you know, if, if you were dominant over that boy, then he had to go, he wouldn't put up a fight. He would just go and find somebody else to hit. And so everybody got hit on the arm. And uh, I was the second 
smallest child in the class. The smallest being Theodore, okay? And so the only one for me to hit was Theodore, okay? So I would hunt him down like an animal on the playground and usually, you know, trap him in the corner over there. And I would go up to him and I would, and he would have just like a hate in his eyes for me. And he would just look at me like this and I would go and I would hit him in the arm and he, like this. And then without fail, he would tell. And there he would go to Sister Florinda, Virgo Potens, vir Virgin Most Powerful, okay, on the other end of the playground with the girls. And she would raise up and she would, and, and by this time he had worked himself up to a complete frenzy of tears. And uh, for effect, of course. And so, you know, he started gyrating things like this, you know, and then he would point to me. And she would raise up and she would look at me and she would just point and go, Ugh. never once did I ever hit him that he didn't tell. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I come over there and he said, she said, sister told me, she said, Mr. Rawls, yes, sir, 305, which was after school. And so I would sigh and I would stay after school. And uh, I, we had to write it was the penance. We always got a penance. And the penance was always the same. Uh, I must not hit Theodore, or I must be good to Theodore, one of the two. Uh, I must not hit Theodore 25 times on the blackboard. And um, we would, have, and I, we didn't know cursive yet in second grade, we didn't learn it. Now they still don't know it, but uh, in those days we had to learn it in second grade. But so I would get up there on her, I, 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 and she, no, then she corrected me, nope, nope, full sentences, full sentences. Oh. And so I must not hit Theodore. I must not hit Theodore 25 times. And I was little, I was up on a stool and uh, my arm hurt and uh, I was allergic to chalk. I didn't know that, but I was. You know, I was bridging my eyes and running, my nose was running. Today, there'd be some type of support group for me, okay? I'd be a victim of somehow. Uh, but in those days, you just got on with it. And uh, so I was writing away, and so I rested. My, and I kept asking myself, why, are, why am I so stupid? I said, I always get caught. Theodore always tells on me, and I always end up here writing these sentences on the board. And so I said, your sister was at the desk in front of me grading papers, and I was up at the board there. So I decided to ask the smartest person I knew, which was Sister Florinda. I said, sister, and she says, yes, Mr. Rolf. She didn't even look up. You know, she said, yes, Mr. Rolf. I said, why am I so stupid? Well, this perked her up. And she says, what do you mean? You're not stupid. You get good grades. I said, no, not that. This. I said, why do I keep hitting Theodore? Said, oh, that, Mr. Rolfs, original sin, Mr. Rolfs, original sin. And I, I knew what original sin, we learned original sin in first grade. Now they don't learn it until sophomore in college. But I, I didn't understand it all, but I knew what the word was. And basically what I knew is that Adam and Eve, it was a sin that Adam and Eve did, and somehow I got blamed for it, okay? So I was not too keen on the concept in and of itself, but I, said, I sort of understood that somehow I was broken. That I got. And I said, well, how do I get fixed? And she says, oh. And she said, um, do you love Jesus? I said, well, yeah. What are you going to tell the nun in second grade, you know? Uh, I said, yeah. And I think I did. By that time, I was going to daily mass because we lived so close to the church. Um, went to every, every week to confession. I had my morning prayers, my evening prayers. Went to Catholic school, praying all the time. Uh, and so, yeah. I said, yeah, I think so. She said, not enough. 
He said, when you love Jesus more than you love hitting, uh, hitting Theodore, you will stop. He said, why do you hit Theodore? Yes, you do. Why do you hit Theodore? You love to hit Theodore, don't you? I felt like he'd stripped me naked, you know, and because she was, it was true. I got a kick out of it. And so I said, yeah. And that's when she repeated it. She said, when you love Jesus more than you love hitting Theodore, you will stop. And I never forgot that. Never forgot it. Uh, in fact, Sister Florinda just died last year. I would, I would call her two or three times a year. And I would tell the seminarians, I said, you know, I just had a nice visit with my first communion teacher. And they go, really? And I said, yes, Sister Florinda. One said, is the tomb nearby? I said, what do you mean the tomb? I said, she, I told her she's still alive. No, your first communion teacher is still alive. I said, yes, she's still alive. She's 98, but she's still alive. Um, and I, I remember that I told her, you know, this story, and she said, you know, I have no recollection of saying it's something I would say, but I, I, I just don't remember saying it. Uh, but I'm happy you remembered it. But that was the first understanding that I have of how to love on earth the way they love in heaven. I had to love Jesus more than anyone or anything else, and I had to love him more than my sins. I had to love him more than I than hitting Theodore. And so every, about every 10 years, I pick up a new nugget. But the problem is, the particular judgment, that's another belief, core belief of the Catholic faith, is that at the end of my life, somehow I meet the Lord. And uh, he, we, we, we sort of cartoonize it by, you know, he's up there on the big throne and uh, your, your name is called, you know, Rolf's present. And then you head on up there and then you got the two angels. One, right, now he did this and this and this and this and this and this, good. And true, true, and a number of other things as soon as I had that heart attack. Uh, there they probably haven't been processed yet, but they're on their way. I was furiously doing good. And then the other angel picks up. You're going, well, you did this and this and this and this and this and this and this, thump and this and this and this wrong. And this and that. I, we get the idea, I said. The horse fell at the first fence. All right. um, and then you're sweating it out. Are you going to go to heaven, uh, to hell, or to the fat farm of eternity, purgatory, okay? And I, I, don't th I don't think it's like that at all. God judges, it's an analogous term, judging. God judges you in the sense that he looks to see if you're ready to be in heaven. And if you're not ready to be in heaven, it would be cruel of him to put you there. It would be too much for you. Um, but yet, you know, most of the people that we know who, who have died, uh, our friends and relatives, we love them, but they weren't perfect. You know, uh, you know, my grandparents had their failings they were mostly good but occasionally they'd lose their temper or you know uh, my my mother and father they had their failings but mostly they were good and that's the lot of most of us we're mostly good but we have some work to do and we die working on it um and once again sister florinda a very wise woman explained that purgatory, because we kept asking her about purgatory, said purgatory 
is the summer school of heaven. And I said, and I understood later because I had to go to summer school once. And it was because I did not know the 12 times tables. And we had to go to the fourth grade. We had to know all the time tables, including the 12 times tables. By, by memory, we had no calculators. And so, uh, and sister kept telling me, you know, you've got to learn these, you've got to learn these. And she said, oh, otherwise you're going to get stuck in summer school. And so I said, oh. and so, but I didn't learn them. I was just stubborn and I didn't do it. I kept putting it off, putting it off. Not out of malice, but just out of I was lazy. I kept saying, oh, I'll get to do it. I'll get, but the time came and I didn't know it. And so she said, well, Mr. Rolf, you're going to have to go to summer school. I said, what? She said, I told you this would happen. You're not ready for fourth grade yet. You ha you're ready in all kinds of other ways, but this, you're not ready yet. I said, oh. So I reported for summer school. I said, how long do I have to be here? She said, until you can recite the 12 times tables, three times, two days apart. And so I said, why do they have to be two days apart? She said, because I don't want you just to memorize them, to spit them out. I want you to know them. Um, I, I said, well, how long will this take me? And she said, well, at least a week. But she says, knowing you, probably two and a half weeks. I said, why would I be taking two and a half weeks? She said, you'll pout the first week, which was true. <laughs> I just sat there and glared at her, you know. Uh, and she said, then you'll settle down and get to work and you'll get it done. You're going to go to fourth grade, but not yet, not until you know the 12 times tables. I said, oh. and, but there was pain in that. Uh, most, it was kind of a physical pain, too, because I was just antsy about it. I had to sit there and I had to watch all the other kids out on the playground playing. And then I was in there with a couple of other kids. And it was my fault. There was nobody but my fault. And I had to stay there as long as it takes me to learn the 12 time table. Uh, and I, re I remember that my mother would come periodically, or the, we had a housekeeper that would bring me a sandwich at lunchtime. And she said, now, you can do this. Keep trying. You can do it. And I said, all right. And so there were people who would come and encourage me. And, and that did put a spring in my step. I said, well, I've got to do this, you know. And, I would read down on it, and then all of a sudden, my mother, or Mrs. Namath, would appear and she'd give me a buck up, and I, I'd redouble my efforts. So I remember all of this putting in when I was doing theology, trying to, uh, and one of the best things that ever happened to me was uh, I had for eight years, I had to teach high school kids. And the, the, the seminarians always said, what does it take to make you a good preacher? I said, teach high school. I said, and if you teach sophomores, if you can get the sophomores to pay attention, you're home. Any congregation will pay attention to you. And so in doing that, I, I remember I had to try to explain purgatory to them. And I used this analogy and it's worked very well. And it's, it explains an awful lot of very somewhat difficult theological concepts into the paradigm of the summer school. And it's exactly what Catholic teaching is. Um, God, you know, says to us that you're not ready for heaven yet. And remember, heaven is a person more than it's a place. This was another thing I learned from teaching high school. The high, for high school students, heaven was like the, the um, uh, six flags of eternity. Okay? It was a big theme park, and God owned it. And so 
when you get in there, you'd have to, you know, say, great theme park, God, great theme park. And we'll be back. We, I hear we celebrate your birthday. Uh, I'll be back to help you sing happy birthday. And I, I hear you give presents out at that time, too. Okay? And so there's even then, there's something in it for you. But once again, heaven is a place for them. But heaven is a person more than a place. I mean, I will be there, you will be there, but what makes heaven heavenly is the fact that I will be there with the person that I love the most in the whole world, God. And unless I have developed my relationship with him to a substantial basis, I would find heaven miserable. And so that God does us a favor. You're not ready yet. You can't take it yet. And so you have to learn how to love on earth the way they love in heaven. You have to learn how to love me with your whole mind, your whole heart, your whole soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Then you're ready. Then you can be happy. And so, you know, purgatory is a place where you go to learn what you should have learned on earth but didn't learn. One is to have a real relationship with him, a substantial relationship with him. And the second is to learn how to live in light of that relationship with him, to love other people the way God loves you. I remember one time I was asking an old Monsignor who was dying. I was sitting with him while he was dying. I said, well, Monsignor, are you ready to go to heaven? He said, I don't know. He says, I worry about one thing. I says, what's that? He, he, he said, an old nun once told me that you're not ready to go to heaven until you can genuinely say you'll be really happy to see everybody that you see there. Now think of that. You're not ready to go to heaven until you can genuinely say you'll be really happy to see everybody that you see there. And I said to myself, uh-oh, this is not good. <laughs> Uh, because I know myself, and I, you know, I, I'll be, after a lengthy purgatory, I'll be up there getting the orientation tour, you know, and uh, the angel will be showing me around, and I'll say, he said, no, this is, and I would say, there's my parents, I'll be over later, you know, and my grandparents, and, you know, uh, famous people, Queen Victoria, you know, uh, President Reagan, you know, President Lincoln, you know, all my heroes and things, and, and uh, some popes and things. And I said, this is just wonderful. I said, yep, you'll meet all kinds of people here. And I'll be, look, I said, who's that? He said, well, you know him. I said, Ted Heil. He, he's here? Yes. In fact, he's living next to you. No. I said, how could he be here? How could he possibly be here? What do you mean God forgives everything? The angel would say to me, well, yes, I know. God forgave you, your sins. Yes, I have sins, but he has sins. And the angel would probably remind me, that was the last temptation. Back to purgatory you go. I was not able, I still had not learned to love other people the way God loves me. To love other people the way we love in heaven, which is no matter what. I was genuinely not happy that God forgave everybody. And until I am, I would be miserable eventually in heaven because I would begrudge God's mercy to other people, but not to myself, of course. So some of the practical questions is how long do I, how, how long do I have to be in purgatory? However long it takes for you to learn what you're supposed to learn. I'm sure they have a rather focused program for each of us. This is what you still need to do, you know, Sister was very clear to me on the 12 times tables. You got the other stuff down, but the 12 times tables, not so much. 
And there would have to be something that I had learned how to live easily. Okay? I couldn't still be struggling with it all. Heaven is a place that I enjoy my relationship with God and my relationship with other people. I can't be still on the learning curve. Okay? Um, is there pain in purgatory? Yeah. Uh, not the fire licking at your boots or anything like that, but there is pain. There was pain in summer school. There was. As I told you, I didn't want to be there, and I knew it was my fault, and I knew I had to stay until I learned what I was supposed to learn, and it was nobody's fault but me. And that's a real bummer, okay? Because I got nobody to blame but me. So now there is pain. Can my prayers help people who are in purgatory? Sure. My mother would visit me. My, the housekeeper would visit me. And they gave me hope. They, they were thinking of me, and they would say, no, you keep trying. It'll be, you, you'll get it. You'll get it. And then I think God helps those. Obviously, he helps those in purgatory. I don't know how he does it, but I know that he does it. And, you know, I'm curious about how he does it. But that's none of my business. One of these days, he might let me figure it out with his help. But right now, he just says, well, I said, how do you do that? Nosy, nosy, nosy. Okay. Never you mind. I, I do it. Just trust me. Um, that notion of, of purgatory has always given me hope because it means that God never gives up on me as long as I don't give up on God. Um, even at the last, God, God never cuts the last thread. If you give him one excuse to save you, he will do it. There are, of course, the people who just will not be saved. They don't want it. People say, well, you know, uh, you know, try to finish up with this, but um, people glibly say today, well, there's no such thing as hell. Um, maybe there's a purgatory, but there's no such thing as hell. God would never do that. Well, it's not God who does that. It's we who refuse to love God. There, you know, it's um, say, just for the sake of argument, say that everybody goes to purgatory. Or unless you go to heaven. Hopefully a lot of people go to heaven, but then for those that need summer school, there's purgatory. But there's never a hell, you say. Well, there's some complicating factors there. What's the purpose of loving, of, of being in purgatory? The purpose is to learn how to love on earth the way they love in heaven, uh, to love other people the way God loves us. It's basically to love God. And what you have to do in order to love God, you have to have free will. It has to be, if someone says, I love you, and is held at the point of a gun, that's not love. So you have to freely love somebody. You don't have to do it. It's a choice. So, say for example, you hold that, you know, in the end, everybody goes to heaven somehow. Well, after a million, million years, you know, God's saying, we're calling it quits. You know, I'm closing down purgatory. And there's only one person left. And so we all gather to see what's going to happen. Because he's, he's the one hold out and has held out for many years, thousands of years. And so anthropomorphically again, God shows up and we all are in the audience there. And he said, Jack, do you love me more than anyone or anything else? You've been in purgatory for thousands of years. You're the last holdout. And Jack says, no, I don't. Oh, come on, Jack. You know, you know, you know I love you. I know, but I don't love you. And I'm not interested in loving you. Heaven would be very boring to me. And I know that makes no sense to you people looking at me, but I don't want to be with you people. 
Well, what's God going to do? Um, he said, well, you know, there's, you know, if you stay in purgatory forever, that's just another name for hell. And if God takes you, he said, no, there's no choice. I mean, everybody has to go to heaven. So close your eyes, Jack. Bzz. Do you love me, Jack, more than anyone or anything else? Yes, I love you more than anyone or anything else. God said, good, come on in. And all the rest of us sort of look around. And what do we conclude? And this was all a game. We worked and tried and corresponded to God's grace in order to be able to freely say, I love you more than anyone or anything else. And we thought it was freely done, but it was a game. If we didn't do that, in the end, God would have forced us. So it's all a ruse. In the end, there is no love. We pretend to love. God gives us a full love, but no real love. And that's why, I, to much to the amazement of my students, I always maintain that hell has to be existing if love exists. Without hell, love cannot exist. Because you have to be able to say to God, I love you totally and completely and freely. And if there is no alternative but to say, I love you, that's the problem. It's easy to say there's no hell, but it's much more difficult to say the consequences of saying that. So I, I hope... Um, you know, and, and there's one last thing. Uh, you know, one of the things that is a conditio sine qua non, a condition without which you can't fall in love with God, you have to have a substantial daily prayer life. And I think that's too glibly understood. A substantial daily prayer life means it has to be noticeable, both to you and to other people. Um, I remember when I was, I was on one of my many, many diets, the doctor put me on a diet and he says, now, this is what I want you to do. And he said, take these, be on this diet. He said, go to the gym, etc." I said, all right. He said, you do this. He said, you'll lose weight. And uh, he said, I want to see you in uh, a month. I said, okay. So I show up in a month. He said, well, how's it going? And I said, well, I mean, the first two weeks, I lost about 10 pounds. Uh, and then it just sort of froze. Nothing happened after that. He said, well, uh, he said, are you, are you following the diet? I said, yes. I, I said, I swear on the stack of Catholic Bibles, I have been following this diet. And he said, well, he said, um, are you exercising? I said, uh, yeah. And he knew me well enough to continue asking questions. And he says, what kind of exercises are you doing? I said, um, push-ups and set-ups. He said, that body does push-ups and set-ups. I said, it does. <laughs> It does, three times a week. And he says, about how many of the push-ups and set-ups might there be? I said, well, a decent number. And he said, define a decent number. I said, um, five and five. He said, you do five push-ups and five set-ups. I said, Yeah. He said, Monsignor, that's not enough. I said, well, I know, but it's better than nothing. He said, no, it's not. He said, I prefer you do nothing. I said, well, why? He said, because right now you're doing five and five and think you're exercising. He said, if you do nothing, you know you're not exercising. He said, you're not really exercising now. He said, but you think you are because you're doing something, but never enough to change, never enough to do anything for you. 
And I said to myself and my students, I said, that's what happens in prayer. We don't ever want to be accused of not praying. And so we pray. But it's never enough to do anything for us. It never can transform us. It never changes us. Okay? We never give God enough time to change us. And that's basically what prayer is. It's not us changing God. It's God changing us and us staying out of God's way. Wonderful little book. If you ever want to read a book during Lent, it's called Time for God by Father Jacques Philippe, P-H-I-L-L-I-P-E. Time for God. A little book that will transform your life if you pay attention to it. So that's all I can say. I started 10 minutes late, so I'm only five minutes over. Uh, I hope that um, I have given you something to think about, um, about the general full spectrum of our lives, uh, why we are here, where we are going, how do I get there, the time of life that I'm in, how God wants me to fall in love with him, and how that happens over the decades of my life. And at the end, God judges or examines me to see if I'm ready. He wants me in heaven, but he's not sure I can take it. And if I can't, he said, well, I want you here with me, and you'll be happy here with me, but not yet. And so I want you to go to purgatory and work on falling in love with me in a real way, in a substantial way, and we'll meet again when you're ready. And that message is a message of hope, knowing that I don't give up because God has not given up on me. And that's, that's the essential hope of purgatory. Uh, it is a requirement of God's mercy. No father would ever give up on his son or daughter as long as they want to keep trying. Uh, but sometimes a son or daughter just quits. And that's hell for the parent. And that's what hell is for God and for us. But hopefully during this Lent, we'll examine ourselves and say, well, how am I doing? What do I need to do yet? What have I got done? Where am I making progress? And to develop that substantial uh, relationship with God on a daily basis that when the Lord asks the ultimate question at the end of your life, at the particular judgment, do you love me more than anyone or anything else? You and I can say, I didn't used to, but yeah, I do now. The ultimate failure would be for us to say, how I wish, but no. But then God can say, lucky for you, You've got purgatory. But don't give up. I'm not giving up on you either. See you in a while. So let's thank the Lord um, for his mercy and compassion and never giving up on us. And uh, that Lent is a time when we try to thank God and make some improvements on our own. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Joyful Catholic Leaders Show. Once again, be sure to subscribe wherever you find your podcasts and follow both the St. Paul Seminary and St. John Vianney College Seminary on social media and at semsp.org. New episodes drop every month on the first Friday of the month in honor of Our Lady of Fatima and the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus. Thanks again for listening and God bless.